Welcome everybody, it's such fun to see you. Welcome to current scholars, returning scholars, guests, and friends of Lucy Banda Ciccioni. This is a very significant moment for us. And today's unveiling marks, as it were, the first of the next steps of a project that's already well underway in Rhodes House, which is to properly reflect on the walls and in the fabric of the house the rich and wide diversity of the Rhodes Scholar community across the generations and across the world. So please, if you're visiting and haven't been in Rhodes House for a little while, please take the opportunity to visit the Rosebury Room, the old library, upstairs, and there now you will find lots of striking photographic portraits of Rhodes Scholars, many of them in their early to mid-career, and those will change on a rotating basis. Um, next door, the Mandela Rhodes Gallery. And then on your way down the stairs, you'll find the wonderful gold spots, uh, each one marking uh, a woman Rhodes Scholar, uh, donated, lovely piece of artwork donated by the Rhodes, um, the Rhodes Project for the 110th anniversary. And then in process, we are working on a rolling screen in the Rotunda, which will um, highlight Rhodes Scholars across the world, past and present, many, many more of them, or you. Um, so that's really fun. But back to today and this significant moment. Um, we're here to mark and to honor the life and work of the first woman Zambian Rhodes Scholar, Lucy Banda Ciccioni, Zambia and Somerville, 1978. And we are absolutely delighted, and personally, I'm really excited that our gentlemen friends over there will now look out on their <laughs> <laughs> um, a colleague uh, worthy in every way of their gaze. And as soon as this portrait is revealed, you will see, I think, that Lucy's uh, direct gaze will certainly hold all of them. <laughs> <laughs> We're hugely grateful for the personal generosity and commitment of our four Rhodes Scholars who've made this portrait possible. Um, to Charles Conn, the warden of Rhodes House, who is very sad not to be here today, but he's um, still in China where uh, he's participated in the selection of the first four scholars from China, which is really exciting. Um, to Anne Olivarius, um, the founder of the Rhodes Project. To Deirdre Saunder, uh, the artist, um, and uh, both are direct contemporaries of Lucy's, and to Tony Abrahams from Australia, I can't see you, there you are, <laughs> who actually came up to Oxford in the year of Lucy's death. Thank you, all of you. Uh, before handing over to Anne, Tony, and uh, Deirdre, I am inviting Karen Mumba, and Kabaleka Kabaleka, both Zambia 2015, to unveil the portrait and to say a few words on behalf of the scholar community in Oxford. Day today, uh, we, we're celebrating the life of Ms. Banda Sichone, a distinguished uh, civil rights activist and the, the first female road scholar from Zambia. Uh, she's best described as a shy, humble, but combative. She, she was a voice of, of, of the voiceless and a great daughter of the nation. Lucy Banda is remembered for her courage to hold the government accountable for their actions. She wrote an article um, in one of the private uh, newspapers in Zambia. At that time, it was the only one which was privately owned. And she risked her life to fight for the justice and equality of the poor and the marginalized. Her vision for responsible governance and the sustenance of people's civil rights continues and shall not fade. When she died, 
Zambia went down to its knees just to remember the life of this selfless person. Lucy Banda will be remembered as a strong woman, a mother, a friend, and most importantly, a person who defied the odds to ensure a better life for the poor, the weak, and the marginalized. She continues to defy the odds even in her passing, and we're very proud today that she's defied the odds and she's on the first woman in the Muna Hall of the Rhodes House. Lucy will be remembered and cherished forever. Long live Lucy. Thank you. Hi. Uh, my name is Karen Mumba, a black Zambian woman. I'm greatly humbled to be able to witness history in the making and having the opportunity to, to speak at this wonderful occasion. As I prepared for my Rhodes selection interview, I took it upon myself to read through the will of Cecil Rhodes and it became quite clear to me that he did not intend the scholarship to extend to women, let alone a black woman. Words like male, manly, manhood makes it clear that the scholarship was never intended for women. The first day I came to Rhodes House, I passed through Milner Hall, and I noticed that it only had portraits of male scholars, most of whom were white, but ab above all, all of them were men. I question myself as to whether these spaces are welcoming to people like me, a black woman. Established in 1902, it took 75 years before women could be accepted as Rhodes Scholars, and it has taken another 38 years for us to have a portrait of a female Rhodes Scholar in Rhodes House. That essentially means it has taken over a century for women to take their rightful and deserved place in Rhodes House. The portrait of Lucy Banda Sichoni in Milnaho is of great significance, not only to me, but to other female Rhodes scholars as well. Due to this portrait today, we feel and see that we indeed have a place in Rhodes House. We feel our voice can be heard and listened to, our importance recognized and valued, <coughs> and our presence welcomed. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is the power of symbols in institutions. Due to the portrait that is unveiled today, I feel this is a place where I can exist and thrive as a female black woman, and my accomplishments recognized, just as that of a, a male road scholar. A big thank you to everyone that has played a role in making this a reality, and I believe this is a step in the right direction. Lucy Banda Sichoni was a woman of substance, a force to be reckoned with, and, and it is indeed a great day for women in Rhodes House today. Thank you. person walking around doing that everywhere I go. So um, it's really such an honor and a privilege uh, to be here in Rhodes House on, for many reasons and um, on many fronts. First, I want to thank a, a couple of people. I want to thank Rhodes House for all the work that they have done in making this event happen, to the warden, Charles Kahn, Charles Kahn and Peter Anderson for their support. Um, also to Mary Eaton, um, for everything she's done today in making this happen. And also um, to Susan, where's Susan? She has all the emails, everything that she sent and um, organized me into making this happen too. Um, and Kelsey, Kelsey Morrell, uh, thank you. I mean, you were the person I first started working with on this project. But my biggest thanks actually go to uh, the Rhodes Project, to Tony Abrahams, and to Anne Olivares and Jeff McAllister um, for their unwavering support of the project and also of my own work. They have been just incredibly supportive um, for years, ever since we were at Somerville together. Um, but most importantly, I want to acknowledge Anne for her lifelong fierce support of women's issues. We wouldn't be here installing the first portrait of a woman in Rhodes House if it wasn't for her. And the Rhodes Project is her brainchild, and she has devoted extraordinary amounts of her own time and money to make this happen and recognize the talents and achievements of some of the most exceptional women of our time. 
I knew Lucy when she was at Oxford. She was the Rhodes from Zambia in 1978, and I was the Rhodes Muzungu from Zimbabwe <laughs> in the same year. We both came from neighboring African countries, but we had little in common. We would never have met if it wasn't for the Rhodes and for our scholarships that brought us together. And I'm forever grateful for that. We both attended Somerville College, and we both chose it because it was a women's college. When Anne asked me to paint Lucy, I was both honored, excited, and even a little burdened by the task. How was I to paint her? The Lucy I'd known in Somerville was difficult, highly opinionated, and balshy. <laughs> She was a person of enormous courage and strength who looked you directly in the eye when she talked to you. She had already lived, had had a baby, was engaged to be married, and then later tragically lost her husband in a car accident. I was just starting to experience life beyond my white privilege in a country at war. I escaped my country. She tried to change hers. I wanted to paint Lucy the way I had known her. But I also had the task of painting her with the importance of hanging in Rose House. She was a highly accomplished journalist and political activist who risked her life for what she believed in. She was totally committed to justice, equity, and equality. And my job was to try and portray her with all these qualities. It was complicated. So the way I knew her and the way she presented herself to the world were not always the same. She also had this soft side to her that I, I wanted in some way to bring across in the painting. It's been 35 years since I saw Lucy, and this year I turned 60, she would have been 61. I have two reactions to these two facts. The first is a pervasive sense that life comes to seem even larger with the passage of time. And the second is more visceral that somehow I made it and she did not. We are, all of us, large and small, though. I hope the painting portrays something of the person I knew, and also much more than that, a symbol of youthful hope. Friends, uh, my name is Tony Abrahams. I'm the co-founder and chief executive of AI Media. Um, I'm also a Rhodes Scholar from Australia in 1998. As Mary said, that was the year that Lucy died. When Anne invited me to contribute to this amazing portrait, um, I, that was the first I'd heard of Lucy. Hopefully it won't be the first, but the next generation of scholars will hear about Lucy. Because Lucy will stand here in Pride of Place in Milner Hall. I can't believe it has taken this long. And I think it's important that we all reflect on why it has taken this long. And but for the work of many people in the room, and but for the support of all of you, it may not have happened at all. So I implore you, as you continue to fight the world's fight, to ask, what else can we do? What other conversation can we have? How can we make this be the start of something bigger? How can we continue this momentum? As a male scholar from Australia, I'm here to say, women matter. Black women matter. Faces matter. Portraits matter. Gender matters. And in this world, race matters. And sweeping it under the carpet or pretending it doesn't matter just perpetuates the injustice. So my thanks to all of you for really letting me be part of this. It's a really humbling experience to be able to contribute in a small way. Uh, and um, hopefully it is the start uh, of a much different second century for the Rhodes Scholarship than the first.
I'm Ann Olivares, and I must say the Lucy Vanda I knew was anything but shy, so I don't recognize that portrait of her. Um, that would be the last word I'd probably use to describe this wonderful woman. We were both up at Somerville together. I met her actually for the very first time. It's as clear as day to me. We were at a gathering uh, in the Rhodes House where the warden used to live, and we were having a cocktail party, which we were invited to. And um, it was the second year when we were up. And I walked in, and here was this woman who was standing by herself with a drink in hand and who had on the most fabulous outfit so around her with glorious colors and a headdress. She looked stunning, but she was also very pregnant. And as I looked at her, I thought, well, how could this be? I walked across and introduced myself, and I said, I'm Ann Olivares, and she said, Lucy Banda. And I said, forgive me to get right to it, but you're pregnant. And she said, I am. And I said, but there's this rule that you can't be pregnant. You can't, well, the rule is you couldn't be married when we came up the first year. And it looks like you probably got pregnant before you got married. And she said, it's a technicality. And I said, I see. Now, I was much younger. And this was really quite an amazing moment for me. And it stands out quite, because as I was talking to Lucy, Sir Edgar Williams, who was the warden at the time, was looking at her, and his wife, Jill, was in the corner looking. I could see Jill knew exactly, I could see. She, was, she knew what we were talking about, because she looked at me in that way that women look at those conversations. <laughs> but, but he, of course, I had that look on his face that it wasn't allowed, it would be a violation of the rules. No Rhodes Scholar could be pregnant, of course, because they couldn't be married. So, of course, she wasn't pregnant. <laughs> no one looked more pregnant than Lucy Bandit in her glory. So that stood out really strongly. I then um, started to see quite a bit of her uh, because she, uh, the other word I would describe her, it was very honest. And she, she rang me up and she said, uh, I'm here from a country where I didn't get a good start. I didn't get good training. I've got a wonderful mind, but I don't know what I'm doing here. I'm drowning. And Oxford had no resource to really help her, guide her. They didn't want to really hear it you know, she'd figure it out, here's your library card, get your degree. That was really how it was approached. So we started to work, she was doing PPE, and to do that degree, um, we would spend a lot of time going over, doing papers, trying to, I and a number of other Rhodes Scholars, try to give her a hand to get her a leg up on, on the process. And then, of course, uh, it came to pass that during her exams, she uh, was, uh, well, pulled out just after the exam, and told that her husband had deceased. And so then came this moment at Oxford where, of course, go back to, you know, some years ago. And um, the Somerville, I remember talking to the principal, and the principal said, well, what do we do? And I said, well, I think you need to organize a ticket home for her. Who would pay for that? Because these things were not, of course, ever assumed. And so the college agreed to pay for the ticket. And then uh, it was really clear, it was before she got back, of course, and found out that all of her possessions had been confiscated by her husband's family. She hadn't anticipated that. That was not something that was in her mind. But she, she said as she sat there, just after the exam on, on the floor, she said, but I have no resources when I get back. How do I bury him? We, I don't have money to pay for that and to do it in a way that should be done. And then my kids. So um, I went around, and actually Deidre Sondra, I was recalling to her this morning as we were driving here, I remember walking out thinking, right, so we need to get some money. But of course, we were all on stipend. Who had any money? You know, it was, you, you knew how much you had to get through just to the end of the month, most of us. So, you know, it wasn't like there was abundance. I remember seeing Deidre sitting in a cafe with someone. I walked in and said, Deidre, do you have any money on you? She looked at me as if, what are you talking about? You know, because I never had that kind of a conversation. And Deidre, of course, being the kindest soul in the world, opens her wallet, and there's a 20. And I remember saying, may I have the 20 for Lucy? She gave me the 20. It's her last 20. <laughs> I take it. It's not like you go then to Barclays and say, one more time, to the ATM. There were no ATMs. That was your 20. <laughs> so that went to Lucy. And I went around to other road Scholars, and other road Scholars and came, and everybody put in you know, what we had wasn't much, but we were able to get a couple of hundred pounds together, which got her back, uh, and, you know, to handle the huge problems that she faced. The next time I saw Lucy was a few years later. I was, at the time, walking through National Airport, which was still National Airport in Washington before it was renamed. 
and I'm walking and I hear somebody shout, Annie! And it's a definite Zambian twang to that Annie. And I think, what? I don't, don't pay any attention. And then I hear that demanding Lucy Banda, Annie! You know, so I turn around and there is Lucy, stunning, again, fabulous dress, native dress, fabulous. And she comes running up to me, and so she gives me this great big hug, and I say, how are you? What are you doing here? She said, I've learned that I can do a lot of good for Zambia if I come and I really try to milk the world agencies for money, for grants. I'm really good at that, and I know how to get them to give us money. And she said, look, I am a, I'm a really good marketer, and she really looked like she could win the world. So I said to her, well, okay, I see you're doing that, and you're doing good. Tell me, what do you think Cecil Rhodes would think of you? you know, as a Rhodes Scholar. You know, do you have any thoughts about that? And she said, oh, I do a lot. And she said, he'd love it. <laughs> Absolutely love it. <laughs> and I said, well, wrote, this is the guy who had issues with blacks and women and maybe was gay and all sorts. He'd love, why would, what would he love about you? Why would he love you, Lucy? She said, because I'm an activist. And he was a prejudiced guy, but she said, I'm a prejudiced woman. I've got my views. He did some bad things at his point in history. She said, and I've done some bad things, and we'll continue. She said, we're all creatures of our time, but I'm an activist. I'm here to change the world. He was an activist. He was determined to change the world, and he'd love me. I remember standing there watching her as she walked off. I was thinking about that because, of course, with the Black Lives you know, Matter movement and where we are today, if I would ask Lucy about that back in the 1990s, of course, she would have said, I'm not for it at all. And I was also Nelson Mandela's lawyer, and of course he'd be someone who would say, no, you know, Rhodes has goodness in him, and they'd be focusing on the goodness, both of these people. Now, her view may evolve over time. She didn't have the benefit of living the extra decades, as some of us have. But certainly she was very much for trying to bring people together, races together, and, and, and feeling very strongly about that. Um, she, she said something else at the time which has stayed with me, which was more, um, in a way, fun. Um, she said it was like 1993, and she got a call from Nelson Mandela. And he um, spoke to her and said that he had left Winnie in 1992, and he was deciding on what his next relationship would be. And she said, you know, I thought hard about that, because I could have been the next Mrs. Mandela. And she said, and I decided um, that um, he wasn't what I wanted in life. Now, now Lucy was a woman who um, was very attractive, and she had a number of partners, and she was very clear about that. And she said, but you know, with Mandela, you needed to be number two. You need to be a woman who knew her place. And, and that's what worked. And she said, I don't want to be number two. I really, um, and she hesitated. She said, I really want to be Nelson Mandela. You know? <laughs> and that was what made her really go. She had that engine that she wasn't going to be the second best. So she didn't marry Nelson Mandela, although she could have. Um, and then, of course, you know, her life ended sadly um, early on um, in sad ways. And I have thought, I mean, from that airport conversation, which was the last time I saw her, you know, and, and we spoke about the effect of the Rhodes Scholarship on her. And she said then that it really, truly changed her life. It did what the scholarship was meant to do. It opened up her world. It let her travel and to be acceptable and to translate the West for the less West and for Zambia. She opened up doors and bridges. She was able to travel and be a part of the larger global community. And she showed through the Rhodes Scholarship that her life could be different. She could live it on a great scale, even back in Zambia and being poor. And I think that is one of the trades that she made. And she said she knew what hatred was when she came to Oxford. And she said she often felt hatred, and race hatred. But she said she also, when she was here, felt that she learned how to open her, that heart and that her judgment about racial issues had altered, that it, it was more open and under review. So I think it, it has served a function, um, this scholarship. Uh, she said she also felt that the scholarship made her feel that she was more worthy as a person, that she could really do something, that she could actually make a difference. She uh, was a feminist, but she had, um, she wasn't a great feminist. You know, she wasn't a card-carrying member of that club. She saw, felt really men and women were very different. She had huge ambition that unfortunately was never realized. And she had that courage and the willingness to fight the good fight. So she was a true 
person under the will that we would trust tries to find. She was there. And I think she had a very hard life in many ways, and certainly the disease that she had to face was really crumbling for her, as it was for so many, because it was early on and no medicines, and, and she had very few resources to you know, find comfort in that painful part of her life. But I think that she's one we could truly say was a um, quintessential Rhodes Scholar. She, her life enriched many others, and she gave what she could, and what she could give was so much more than she ever anticipated, because she learned how to give everything that was inside of herself. Thank you. Thank you.